Hello, my name is Adele Tomlin, and in this episode of Dakini Conversations, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Ju Lan, a female scholar and translator originally from China, whose PhD in 2020 from the University of Virginia was on the life of the highly realized Tibetan yogini, female lineage holder, and famous consort of Guru Padmasambhava, Yeshe Sogyal. Dr. Liang is an assistant professor in the Department of Religious Studies at Case Western Reserve University and is currently completing her first book entitled Conceiving the Mother of Tibet, The Early Literary Lives of the Buddhist Saint Yeshe Sogya, which is based on her PhD. Although there are now a few English language publications about Yeshe Sogya, Liang's is one of the few PhDs that considers Sogya's life and legacy to the standards of academic research. And in that respect, one could say that Dr. Liang is one of the foremost scholar translators in the world today on Sogyal. She is also working on a second project, tentatively titled, Thus Has She Heard, Theorizing Gender in Contem Contemporary Tibetan Buddhism. In particular, Liang has written about the Tibetan nuns based at Laranga in Tibet and the institution of the Kenmo program there and their views of gender and biology as Buddhist practitioners. She is also interested in the theory and practice of translation in general and translating Tibetan literature in, in particular. So without further ado, a good evening and a good morning from India to the USA and welcome to Dakini Conversations, Dr. Julian. Thank you very much for inviting me. And I am a scholar, I am a translator, certainly not a Dakini. So I'm <laughs> very excited to be talking about um, basically awesome Buddhist women in Tibet though. So I'm very happy to be here. Well, thank you very much for, for joining uh, this conversation. So um, first of all, I just wanted to thank you very much for your research on women in Tibetan Buddhism and Vajrayana and your absolutely fascinating PhD on Yeshe Sogyal. But before getting into detail about Sogyal and the female Buddhist practitioners in Tibet, though, um, please tell us a little bit more about where you're from, your hometown, uh, you know, your family and uh, any any Buddhist influences as well uh, while you were growing up there. Thank you. I actually have a great um, punchline for this introduction. When I always tell my students in the United States where I'm from, I'll say, well, I do research on Tibet, usually consider the, the rooftop of the world because of the elevation. And I, I hail from Chengdu. It's a city in the um, Chengdu Basin, also in southwestern China. So I consider that the roof gutter of the world. <laughs> So that's that's where I'm from. So I, I grew up quite close to Tibetan communities, but that is not something I think I had an intellectual interest in until actually a, a little bit later in my study. So my undergraduate is in Chinese language and literature, and my master's degree actually shifted to start learning about Sanskrit and Tibetan. So it's the learning of those two, and as we all know, of very important languages for Buddhist studies that made me really interested in, in Tibetan culture, in South Asian culture, and by extension, because of Buddhism's importance in Tibet, and in Buddhist culture and Buddhist history. And once I finished my first master's degree at Jimin University of China in Beijing, and then I decided to, I, I should continue this, I would love to, and then I... I started my postgraduate study in the United States. So first at the University of Chicago in the Divinity School, where again, my mind is blown on the, the field of religious studies. I did not even know that it's a possibility you can study religion from a scientific perspective. So that is something entirely new and extremely exciting for me. And then I continued with my PhD at University of Virginia. I think you already mentioned that. So kind of you started with Tibetan and Sanskrit and the, the rest is history. Yeah. And for you also asked about Buddhist influence. Mm. And I, I always say I'm not a card carrying Buddhist, but I have been living with, have been thinking with, have been basically spending my entire intellectual life in the in Buddhist studies in, as a field. And I think at this point, it will be also hypocritical to say that I I would not identify as a Buddhist. So it is something that is 
deeply personal to me as well as professional. So I like to to think of myself as a, a very, very engaged community member, mm. but might not have that um, certificate or membership card just as yet. And yes. I always have a personal interest in Buddhism. I think I read actually a lot of um, scriptures just on my own, actually in Chinese when I was in undergrad. So I yes. took my first Indian Buddhism class in my master's, and that is just philosophically, intellectually, and I think I think in terms of thinking about oneself and one's place in the world, that is something I align myself very closely mm. with. Okay. I hope this answers um, your question. Yeah, that does. Thank you. And um, so you mentioned that you moved uh, away from China to do a master's in the USA, in Chicago. Um, and uh, that was your first move to the USA, was it? And how did you find uh, adjusting to life there, you know, coming from China into the US? How how easy was that? And what kind of challenges did you face? Well, I, I could complain about the food for a whole hour, but I, I know you don't want me to do that. <laughs> and I think for, for me as an international student, and especially starting in the postgraduate degree, a lot of the challenges I did not foresee is how how much the reading is. And even though I, I thought I had really good English at the time, I'm just totally overwhelmed by the reading our my first semester at University of Chicago. So there's an introduction to the theory and methods of religious studies course. And our first week meeting, we had to read um, Kant's The Religion Within the Boundaries of Pure Reason. And we all know it's not <laughs> the most easy yeah. read in that sense. And I, I think that really took me the better part of the semester to try to catch up, to be able to finish the reading, make sense of the reading, put it into context, and also trying to be able to contribute my, my thoughts in the, in the seminar setting. So I think that yeah. kind of barrier of uh, language, but also other cultural customs of a graduate yeah. study system in the United States is something I initially find very challenging. Yes, yes. And, uh, and but you managed to overcome those eventually with the language barrier. Um, and, um, you know, before we start talking a little bit about your PhD, then at the University of Virginia, um, now you mentioned that you 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 visited um, Larangar. Uh, was it in two thousand fourteen? And um, this is a, a very famous monastery in in Tibet. And uh, you know that you saw that they published a collection on you know women's biographies and stories and previously unpublished life stories of Yeshi Sagya. So perhaps you can talk a little bit about that and how, how I mean, is that kind of what led you to do the PhD at the University of Virginia? What was the impact of going to Larangar and, and uh, seeing that collection? Yes, I, I'd love to. Um, actually, that is at the conclusion of my first year of PhD at University of Virginia. And a little bit, maybe a little bit of a longer, just because I, I find it to be a fascinating place. It is actually one of the, the Buddhist monastic institutions in China that it has been found after what we might call the revival of religion in China post-1979, with opening up and reform and so with the reestablishment of the freedom to practice religion. So it is found by Campbell Jimmy Prinzel in early 1980s, and very quickly grew exponentially, not just in the Tibetan population, but in Han Chinese as well as international population as well. So at one point, I think it, it is deservedly one of the largest monastic in institutions in mm. the world. So I, it's just a fascinating place. And I, on the other hand, is a fresh first year PhD student. I was talking with my advisor Dr. Curtis Schaefer still at the University of Virginia about what to do. I know I have an interest in literature, in narratives. I find that always fascinating. I know I wanted to to work something on Buddhist women. So he suggested I look at this collection that was just published by the Larong Arya Tari Press, this um, 15 volume and very quickly after it becomes 16 collection of life stories of great Buddhist women. 
And I started looking at it and I realized、um, a couple of the life stories of Yeshi Tsugyo in there wasn't published previously, or at least you could not find it on a lot of the Tibetan digital resource website.、Um, the T- then TBRC, now BDRC, Buddhist Digital Resource Center, do not have a collection on that at, at that time. And you don't find it in the Nepal German manuscript program. So I decided to just to pay a visit because it is physically located in Sichuan, kind of on my way to see my parents <laughs> every year when I go back home. So the, the first summer after my PhD study, I just went actually with my parents. We, we drove up there and there were some challenges along the road. The road wasn't great, it's a little bit better now. And we, we were there. I got connected to the, to the nun who was one of the members at Arya Tari Press. And she was very supportive and very encouraging of this project that I'm interested、right. in pursuing. And I think that is one of the things that shocked me in the first、mm. case is you go to a Buddhist monastic institution, especially in Tibet, you expect to see monks. Knitting around, they're debating with each other. You rarely see nuns. If you do, you see them in the kitchens, you see them in the courtyards, you see them doing chores. But I think at Longar, you really do see actually more nuns than monks. And you talk to the nuns, they're clearly in charge. They clearly、mm. have their own thoughts and they clearly are very comfortable expressing them. So I feel very encouraged. I find that place to be fascinating. After that first trip, so I, I kind of just keep going back. And I still did my dissertation on Yeshi Tsogyo, which is to a great extent thanks to their publication. And also, I also would love to continue working with this group of nuns and write something about them too. Yes.、Uh, and uh, actually, you know, hopefully we'll get on to talk more about Lao and Gar and the Kenmo program. Uh, a little bit later on. Now,、um, going on to your dissertation then on Yeshi Sogyo.、Um, so, you mentioned in the introduction that you know, she was said to have lived in 8th century Tibet. However, literary accounts about her did not flourish until some 600 years later. So, your dissertation examines how an origin narrative with her as one of the core personas emerged during the 14th and 15th centuries. And、um, in particular, you look at three aspects of the role of Yeshi Sogyal as a disciple, a consort, and a kandroma or dakini. So、um, during this interview,、um, you know, we, we hopefully we'll go on and talk about these in, in more detail, these three aspects of her, which are you know, absolutely fascinating.、Um, but before we get on to those,、um, first of all, I wanted just to talk about because your PhD opens with. Uh, this kind of the soul of Yeshi Sogyal, if you like, and the sacred places that she's associated with in Tibet.、Um, for example, you mentioned in 2016, you visited a birthplace of Yeshi Sogyal, Nadrak, in Tibet, and what's called the Lasso and Lashing,、uh, the Soul Wood and Soul Lake.、Um, so, and, and interestingly, you mentioned the role of actually a Kama Kagyu Lama, Lama Shang, in the Sogyal Lakang. So,、um, I wondered if you could talk about that a little bit. I actually,、um, there's a,、uh, some very nice pictures that you have as well in your, your PhD,、um, you know, showing these places.、Um, so, yeah, I wondered if you could, you could、uh, talk a little bit about those places and, you know, what that means, the soul. I mean, in Tibetan, it's the word la, right? So, what does that mean to you? Absolutely. And I, I should mention that if you would like high resolution originals of those photos to visit this podcast, I'll happily send it your way. Thank you. Yeah. And yeah, so I was very fortunate to be, to be supported by a number of different foundations and also fellowships to, to travel to a lot of important sites that are associated with Yishi Tsogyo. Not all of them, but there's a good number. There's some in Nepal, some in Bhutan. And the, the birthplace of Yeshi Tsogyo in the village of Ngaja in central Tibet is、uh, one that, that you mentioned. I went in 2016. And I think the way I opened my dissertation with that is because I, I keep getting asked the question, which I, I think is it's an interesting question in itself, but it's not a question that I seek to answer in my dissertation. 
is that people will ask, is Yishi Toge real? Or mm-hmm. when exactly did she live? Or do we have any archaeological evidence about her? I think those are worthwhile questions to ask. And unfortunately, to my knowledge, I, I do not think we have imperial edicts on stones carved, carved with her name on it. If we have that, that would be really neat, right? <laughs> so, but we unfortunately do not. We have some pre 13th, 14th century narratives, uh, mostly in the treasure tradition or in the in the brief uh, Buddhist history accounts, mentioning her name either as Togyo or as Karchinsa, so a lady of the Karchin clan. And I think that is where we see the first appearance of her as a, a important woman who have who is considered to be lived in the time of the Tibetan Buddhist Empire and has played a huge role in the golden age, let's say, of Tibetan Buddhism, but also in the in the Renaissance and post-Renaissance period of Tibet. And so what my dissertation is trying to do, I think in essence, is to to find out what this so is and mm. what it means for the Buddhist community, mostly for the treasure, Tibetan treasure writers who are writing about her at this time. So what do they conceive her to be? And mm-hmm. what does this literary representation they created of her become representative of the zeitgeist, but also become something that men and women can both use and to negotiate with their communities? Yes. So I'm, I'm very glad you you asked this question about her soul. Is I, I think her soul is her continued incarnation and reincarnation in embodied form yes. where you have actually actual Tibetan women claiming to be her reincarnation. We also have her actually appearing in the form of Togyo in people's visions and mm. dreams, even as of today, people will be making supplications to her, people will practice rituals, actually trying to connect with her in all of those various forms. So I think in essence, she she is still there. She's there in central Tibet. She is in mm. Paro Datsang in Bhutan. She is in Nepal and she's in many of the in places that consider her a part of their tradition locally yes. and also across Tibet. So that is why I, I wanted to open with that story. Yes. Of me thinking about her. So and thank you for asking that. Well, thank you for for sharing that because actually, of course, in, in as you know, in the Buddhist kind of terminology, a soul is, you know, it's not, uh, you know, obviously there is considered to be no self and no soul. But yeah, the the word la, like you say, it has that element of an enduring sort of, I guess, energy or you know something like that within those places. And you you do talk about the importance of visiting a place and the geography itself in your research. And I was also very, very happy to read this, Um, you know, that academic research or scholarly research, uh, not just as a, you know, as a practitioner, but as a scholar, place and geography play an important role in understanding a person or, or, you know. um, So perhaps you could also mention a bit about that because uh, not everyone necessarily associates associates being in a place as a kind of a, an essential part of research, right? Absolutely. I I think there is a pragmatic reason about this is I love reading books, but it's bad for my health. I cannot be sitting for very long and I love to, to get out in the world. And, but also in terms of intellectually thinking about a tradition, thinking about writings, there's always a way of thinking it contextually. And it includes many, many embodied as well as material aspect. So to to think about right now, I'm in Cleveland, Ohio, I'm in a public library, (laughs) I'm breathing air conditioned air, (laughs) and that's somewhat consistent throughout the day. (laughs) It's not very fresh. (laughs) <laughs> but if I'm in central Tibet, yeah, I landed in Lhasa Gunga Airport. First of all, the oxygen level went down immediately <laughs> at the elevation yes. of 8,000 feet. So, so I will feel that immediately. The air is crisp. Yes. It's outdoors. Likely much colder. Maybe nice in the sun, but when the sun comes down, it gets really bad. 
And I think those are ways that actually the horizon you look at when、mm. you get off the airport is you immediately see the mountains, you see the rivers. The landscape, in many many ways, also defines the way you you think about your community, you think about your means of travel, you think about your local resources. And we don't even need to get into paper production、mm. and what kind of paper is used, what kind of、um, artisan craft is possible. So I think a lot of those things contribute to the intellectual、mm. history, but we've、Definitely. only seen、yeah. recently in religious studies as well in historical studies this material turn or this turn toward embodiment. So I think that is something I always find fascinating. It's just to, and fortunate enough to be able to to go to those places to breathe the air to. To touch the earth, as <laughs> some people will commonly、yes. say these days, and to just to see what it is like to imagine having lived in that area, despite、right. the massive change that has gone through. But still, you can you can get a sense of the space. Yes, and you can get a sense of the the soul, the the la, right, the energy. And yes, I mean, I'm speaking to you from Himalaya, India, in the mountains, and so yeah, it very much is a it very much has an impact on on you know how you feel in a place and your energy levels and everything. So,、um, going then on now to Sogyal as the woman, before we go on to sort of textual sources and you know the, those three aspects. So,、um, one of the things, obviously, which is undeniable, is that you know Sogyal is a very famous female you know, woman yogini. And、uh, one of the interesting things I found in your PhD, in particular, was how you contextualize gender into three main categories, which is the biological sex, social gender, and theological gender. So、um, now this is this is really fascinating because、um, this is also something you know that I'm also interested in about, particularly how biological sex, you know, in in terms of consort and Vajrayana practice, which we can get onto when we talk about Sogyal as a consort.、Um, But just a, on a main sort of general level about Sogyal,、um, so perhaps you can explain a little bit more、uh, more about that, about where she fits in in those three kind of categories, and how they overlap. I guess is kind of what you're also saying, right? Absolutely. Thank you so much for picking that up. That's、mm. that's something I'm I'm always, and I, I think I still am thinking through. So I'm happy to. To talk about how I perceive of those three categories, I'd love to to hear your thoughts on that as well. So I think the reason I propose a threefold category of thinking about gender issues, specifically in the not just in the Tibetan Buddhist but in the Buddhist context, that is, as you said, biological sex, social gender, or cultural gender in some senses,、mm-hmm. and then theological or linguistic gender, is. That I don't think the Tibetan or the Indian theorists we were reading and we were trying to think with have read Judith Butler. They are not English speakers. They think from a very different. Again, going back to the embodied and the linguistic part of it, they think in a very different language. They live in a very different land at a very different time. Surely, they see there is the perceived. Physical as well as mental differences between men and women, but they have a very distinct way of thinking about it. There are ways of talking about biological sex. I think you will see in Buddhist literature、mm-hmm. as early as the Abhidharma Kosha, they will talk about gender as a sense faculty in a way, and I, I find that quite liberating. In that, it is not something we'll directly call biological sex. Although it is biologically determined,、mm. but it is also not something that is entirely cultured. In、mm-hmm. that sense, is there is an embodied aspect you use that to connect with and to interact with the world. So the kosha will talk about gender as a sense faculty, meaning that it is something that is conditioning you in a very embodied sense, but it also also is some way you extend yourself outward to、mm. to connect with this world. So I, I love teaching this passage, and I can find it for you if you like to add it to the blog post、mm-hmm. um, in from the kosha to the students because I think it contains a lot of rich details of how pre-modern South Asian thinking about gender and how that difference in our post-Enlightenment society、yes. or a liberal progressive definition of biological sex and gender. But yet there is 
for me another level, I think, how Buddhism specifically talks about gender and specifically thinks about gender and its supposed irrelevance mm-hmm. is to talk about theological or linguistic gender. So there are genders of men, so human men and women, but also there are genders of deities who mm. have no embodied forms. And that's something I think a lot of scholars of South Asian religions, so this exists not just in Buddhism, but in Hinduism and Jainism as well, has wrapped their head around is how do we imagine a disembodied form of gender? And how do yes, we... Yes, exactly. If in fact right? the deities are what we might say are gendered, right? Which is the whole question I think, you know, you're alluding to there is... Uh, although they're called male and female, are they actually, because they're awakened, enlightened deities, do they fit into human categories of biology and gender anyway? But perhaps we can get onto that more when we talk about the Kenmos at Larangar and their sort of ideas about biological sex and gender. Um, of course. And how that, and, and also as a Vajrayana practitioner, because uh, the thing is the biology of being male or female is is inescapable in those sorts of contexts in a way. But anyway, um, let's go on to your uh, dissertation a little bit more. And um, if we could just briefly look at some of the the textual sources here that you you refer to. So, you in your in your first chapter you say um, you know you are outlining the early written information about Yeshi Sokyal and uh, introducing you know the primary sources and. Uh, various sort of genres at work in in the literary tradition. And uh, I noticed these are, uh, if not all, actually predominantly Tibetan uh, language sources, right? Um, And the Shulen, the question and answer, um, which we can again get onto when we talk about Yeshi Sogyal as a disciple. But um, just out of interest, were there any Sanskrit or Indian texts available on Sogyal at all? A sort of Indian origin? That is a great question. I do not think that we have. We may have something in, of Indic origin referring to Pama Sambhava. Mm. And those are a little bit earlier. I think Jake Dalton and Sam Van Skyke at the British Library has written about it, along with a few other scholars. Now I can immediately remember mm. um, about Don Huang materials quite a little bit earlier that might be references to Pama Sambhava. But I, I do not think we have Wang San Yishi Tsongyo at that point. And okay. you're correct. Those are mostly Tibetan sources. Yes. And uh, and so you mentioned, I mean, you list the sources that you're using uh, in your in your um in your PhD. Um and so just kind of, you know, if you were to summarize generally what those sources are, you know, how would you sort of categorize them and summarize them for the for the people listening? Of course, I'd be happy to. And I should mention that this is not a solo project. I was fortunate mm-hmm. enough um, to study with my advisor, Dr. Curtis Schaefer, who's a book nerd, and my grand advisor, um, Professor Leonard van der Kuyp at Harvard, who actually is one of the first people I read literary Tibetan with, who has also a great memory of anything that has to do with Tibetan history and literature. I also read with um, Janet Gatso at Harvard mm-hmm. University, who have so generously offered her time. And also with Elizabeth Zangowski, who wrote another dissertation on Yeshe Tsogir around the same time I graduated. So this is really a a group effort Mm. of the four of us and many other scholars we send endless emails to asking about, hey, what kind of materials do you have about Yeshe Tsogir? And and also my other advisor, David Germano as well, so they are all a wealth of knowledge to to mm. me, and I, I think I can speak on Liz Zangowski's behalf to her as well, of just in the first phase, it's just to try to find everything you can find on Yeshe Tsogil. We started with a lot of early historical sources. So there's 12th, 13th century Buddhist history that mentions, I think I said a little bit ago about the name Karchansa. Mm. which we assume to be um, the re- referring to this woman later we know as Sogil or as um, Yeshe Sogil. We look at specifically Nima resources. So that's where the majority of the narrative literature about Yeshe Sogil is located, especially in the, in the time period where I wrote my dissertation on. So those are a lot of them belong to the genre 
of treasure, I think I already mentioned this mm -hmm. term a while ago, is an in Tibetan term of literature. So those are actually revealed teachings claiming to be have buried in the time of the Tibetan Empire when Pama Sambhava was about to leave Tibet. So the whole narrative has him entrusting Yeshe Tsogyo with all of his teachings and having her encode them in a secret language, some, sometimes called the, the Dakini language, and conceal them all over Tibet. And then they will be progressively rediscovered by treasure revealers through various means, material or immaterial, and all over Tibet. So we look at a lot of treasure literature from this time period from, and this is also the time period when the treasure tradition is starting to arise. So you can see the kind of the logical connection between those two. Yes. So starting with Nyangwe Nima Oser in the 12th, 13th century, there's a little bit uh, of Guru Chewang, but uh, not a huge standalone biography. There is this um, church revealer whose name is Jime Gunga, who lived in the 14th century. I think, again, Professor Janet Yato first discovered a manuscript of Yeshe Tsogyo's biography by Jime Gunga, and that is in the 1990s in Lhasa, speaking of um, back to central Tibet again. And then there is the Larong collection contains mm. the Jime Gunga version, but also a, a very similar text attributed to Bema Lingba, who is considered one of the most important Buddhist masters in what is today Bhutan. So that's 14, that's 15th century. And yes. for the Shulin genre you mentioned, I also referred to uh, Rinzing Gurdon, which was also actually inspired by another colleague at University of Virginia, um, Katerina Tepenen, and whose dissertation focused on the unimpeded sound, the Gumba Santel tradition by Rinzing Gurdon, who also lived in the 14th century. So really it is a accumulation of all the Genje or the karmic connections I have physically at the University of Virginia, at Harvard University of this scholar community who are so generous as to provide me with all they know about any of the literary sources about Yoshi Tsogyo. So that's how I, I gradually look through all of them and piece the picture together. I hope this is not a too long an answer to a very simple <laughs> it's question. It, it's, it, it's fine. It's okay. Okay, so uh, now uh, let's talk a little bit about the names of Yeshe Sogyal. So in your in your thesis, you mentioned that it, her father um, gave her a name, Yeshe Sogyal. And uh, he says the reason is Yeshe is one of the classes of Dakinis. And so, he says, pertains to staying in the womb um, in the Namso. And Gyal relates to awakening at the time of Gyal. So this is a kind of <clears throat> way he spells out the name of Yeshi Sogyal. And then later you, you also talk about how she was named Kandro or Kandro Ma when she, after she liberated beings in the hell realms. Um, so I wondered if you could just briefly talk about that, the different names. Of course. Yes, I think I already referred to a little bit ago that the, the earliest account we find referring to Yeshe Tsogyo is the name Karchensa. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the biographical accounts do agree that she is a aristocrat lady from the Karchen clan. I think some texts read it as Karchu, but I, I think that might just be a, a scribal mistake. And later we will see the Karchensa Tsogyo. So she will be giving a specific name. And the girl here, uh, usually today we see as girl as victorious, but earlier, again, earlier manuscripts sometimes um, wrote as guess, so that is something to expand. And sometimes it is written as um, ge, which is born, so you will see Tsogyo as a, another name to refer to the lotus. So mm -hmm. there is a little bit of discrepancy in early sources about her name. And my impression is that the, the Buddhist part, so-called, or the Buddhist part of her name, Yeshe, was added a little bit later. So to so as to formalize her status in the pantheon as a wisdom dakini. And I, I think there is also, even though just phonetically, again, talking about not just reading text, but to think about pronunciations, of Togyo as Lotus. And I think that is also a, a link to her with some Pama Sambhava, mm. who is the Lotus born master, right? Generally, that's how he has been translated. 
So I think there is a few different ways um, you see her being referred to, but you can see the gradual Buddha cessation and her elevation of status. And in the end, you will have at the end of one of her life stories, she actually received the title of a, a Dakini or a Kanjuma. So right. I think you see that process happening. Yes, and that's something you know definitely want to talk about as uh, the Dakini. So, um, so you, you you cover these three aspects of Yeshi Sogyal as a disciple, as a consort, and as a Dakini. So let's just go through uh, that and some of what you say there, which is very very interesting. Um, so. Uh, in uh, the second chapter, you talk about the disciple Yeshi Sogyal, and uh, you say this examines the outer, almost publicly accessible role of Yeshi Sogyal as the foremost disciple of Padma Sambhava, and she is very widely known as that. In fact, you know, that's what a lot of people will associate her as, right? Um, and um, you, you mentioned that, you know, this is evidence in many treasure texts, colophons. And uh, she's also frequently cited as the disciple responsible for receiving and transmitting Padmasambhava's teachings to future generations. And in particular, you look at the Shulen text, which is the question answer text, and um, how these dialogues are also very rich as a way to um, not only uh, look at Yeshe Sogyal as a, as a disciple, but also the issue of female inferiority and women's access to Buddhist teachings. And uh, you mentioned that the conversations often begin with descriptions of the inferiority of women by the female disciples themselves. And Padmasambhava chastises these women for not setting their minds and, and uh, on the Dharma and squandering their precious human life. Now, you discuss this sort of kind of format, you know, this kind of the women themselves discussing their inferiority, Padmasambhava kind of chastising them. And uh, you kind of talk about this as a, you know, a way in a way to, um, you know, perhaps avert some kind of a radical challenge to the status quo, but at the same time, create a literary space uh, for women's access to Buddhist teachings and practice. Now, this is obviously very interesting because this is obviously quite controversial, right? Some people will say, you know, what's all this to do with inferiority of women's bodies and, you know, so... Perhaps you could speak a little bit to that as as a, as she is as a disciple and how she seems to deal with this whole issue of the inferiority of women's bodies. Thanks so much for the close reading. And I'd love to. I should say that um, the three main body chapters of my dissertation actually concerns with the outer, inner, and secret aspect you see in the life story or in a nantar. I did not come up with this. Um, this is um, something I think first considered in Andrew Quinkman's study in the life of Mila Reba, but I find that to be a useful categorization to, to think about the different aspect of a subject of a hagiography. So this first chapter, when she was described and or at least remembered most frequently and most publicly as Pamasambhava's disciple, is really one of the first instances, and we have two more coming up, where I see how she, as a exemplar Buddhist woman, negotiate. On the one hand, we know that women are historically disadvantaged in Tibetan Buddhism. There's fewer textual resources given to them, fewer nuns in Tibet, and they have fewer access to, to Buddhist higher status in the community, as well as resources and education. But on the other hand, I think there is an interesting tension of how women actually using some of those discourses on their female inferiority, which is a very common trope. We, we don't need to repeat the disheartening words, but to actually negotiate or to create a space that actually allows them to get teaching and to get practice. So the reason I started with Shulen literature is that this is actually a huge body of literature that's quite popular in the 14th and 15th century we see in different treasure cycles. The reason why is that I, I think it does, and I make this argument in the dissertation and in a separate article that will come out soon, that it makes itself, in terms of its format, in terms of narrative sequence, after the classical Mahayana Buddhist scripture, as well as the Tantra format of setting the, the time, the space, the retinue, and the conversation, and the disciple asks the teacher a question, the teacher will respond, 
And in the end, they will rejoice in the teaching and the teaching will be recorded for future generations. So I think this is an intentional adoption of that classical scriptural format to establish authority in this new treasure revealed literature tradition because you do see them being challenged, the Lima school being challenged by the Sarma school mm. who in simplified terms was re-importing Buddhist teachings from India fresh at the time while the Nimas claimed to, to have inherited the old teachings from the Tibetan empire. So there's a need to say that our teaching is the authentic Buddhist teaching. So I think the Shulin texts do serve that purpose, but also a lot of them are attributed to female practitioners. So not just Yeshe Tsogyal, but a lot of female disciples, Padmasambhava. So I think the sheer quantity of it and also the, the sheer predominance of Yeshe Tsogyal as the disciple, much like Ananda in the, Buddha, in the Buddha's life story, to be able to speak with Padmasambhava to have this intimate connection with him and to receive actually extensive teachings from him, do speaks to, at least in those literary representations, women's ability to receive teaching and practice. And I try to make this a twofold argument, not to say that the female inferiority represented in this text are somewhat savageable or they're actually not that bad. I think they are, and if you read a lot of the text I translated in that chapter, you, you, you furrow your eyebrows and it's not super impressive. We see a lot of the classical denigrations of women. Mm -hmm. But I do think that in the other hand, I think we should also read between the lines and to say, on the one hand, there is a lot of detailed accounts of women's inferiority in the form of what prevents them from practice. Mm -hmm. What are the domestic labors they were unfairly assigned that makes them makes it harder for them to be a Buddhist as a woman? And I think we should also take that seriously to say that this, if it if this is not a call to for women to realize their condition existence, at least somewhat of a sympathetic view of recognizing that women do have extra burdens as a practitioner. So that is one of the, the finer points I was trying to make. Mm -hmm. And the other one is to, to also think about the formality of this text in that you almost always have a female disciple asking Pamasambhava a question and he will talk about how he will give the teaching first. And sometimes he will respond also with a admonition of female inferiority mm -hmm. to say, this is really hard for women. But I, I think you, if you practice hard, you can do it. So there is this actual act of giving the teaching. There is admonition. But Padma Sambhava did not just say, you cannot do it. I'm not going to give it yes. to you. Rather, he gave the teaching. And then he said, this is really hard. So I think it'll be also uncharitable yeah. for us to read it as saying, this is just female inferiority. I think there is a little bit more going on there. Yes. So I want to say yes. I'm trying to advocate it more close, more sympathetic reading to see, is there a space for women to negotiate their access to a Buddhist education and practice? Yes, uh, definitely. And, um, but that was one of the interesting things I found that, you know, because obviously Yeshi Sogi then went on to be a teacher, right, in her own right, and, uh, you know, took on consorts and almost took, you know, like like a, Padmas, a female Padmasambhava, um, and um, but you don't sort of necessarily bring out that aspect of her as a teacher. Was there a reason for that, or was it just kind of space and uh, you know uh, that you didn't focus on her as teacher? Or is that coming more into the sort of Dakini kind of aspect that you looked at? I'm so glad you you asked this question. So <laughs> right now I'm in the process of revising the dissertation, and one of the decisions I made is to add a additional chapter to discuss Yeshi Tsogyal's role as mother and took it, I took the term mother to be someone who's in a caretaking role, someone yeah. who is someone senior of wisdom, of compassion. And that is where I, I hope I will end. So this will come after the, the third body chapter of Dakinis. And I hope I'll, in that case, I'll be able to end on her own transformation, mm. her apotheosis in that sense of her as a teacher in the end 
starting with the disciple and the consort and the dakini, and then she great. became the, the mother of Tibet as we remember her. Okay, excellent. All right, great. Well, let's move on to then her, her as a consort, because again, there's a sort of kind of a, an assumption there, and you probably have uh, come across this as well, that the consort is inferior in some way. And uh, yet in the Vajrayana world, you know, a consort is supposed to be considered in the practice, at least as an equal, but that's another discussion. But anyway, in your own chapter three, you, you discuss the consort Yeshi Sogyal, particularly her relationship with uh, Guru Padmasambhava and uh, as, as one of the five women. But you quote a beautiful quote uh, where you say, Princess Mandarava, the Nepalese Kala City, the Nepalese girl Shakya Devi, the Mampa girl Tashi Kiedren, and the woman Yeshi Sogyal. These are the five women that captivated the heart of the master, that being Guru Padmasambhava. Now, one thing I really enjoyed reading your thesis was some of the headings that you use as well, which are kind of very contemporary and interesting. Like, for example, you start this chapter with deal with your ex before you become a consort, you know, and that kind of made me chuckle a bit. Um, and then consorts as nuns and then the goals of consort practice. So, you know, if we just, uh, you know, first of all, deal with this whole thing of the ex before you become a consort. So what was that about and why did you put that in your in your thesis with, with uh, Yeshi Sogyal. Thank you. I do try to have fun when I write. <laughs> and I think this chapter, I should probably start by saying that I think there is a lot of problems and issues and abuse and also all, the, all of the different negative associations we see with tantric consortship in the past as well as in the present. And this chapter's purpose is to argue that in the 14th and 15th century literature about Yeshe Tsogyo, consort relationship is imagined as something that's sublimated from secular intimacy. And the two case studies I chose is how Yeshe Tsogyo parted with what I understood to be her former lover and how she described herself as a nun, which is a very interesting term because a nun is by definition a set of a practitioner. Mm -hmm. But this argument, I don't think it actually is trying to go against what we are trying to also unravel in the Buddhist community of the implications of secrecy of power imbalance in council relationships. I think Holly Gailey has wrote a lot on the role of secrecy in Sang Yung, so secret consort. And Anne Glegg and Amy Langenberg has been doing a lot of fascinating work on abuse in American Buddhist communities. So I think we're just starting to, to do that work. But this chapter specifically takes its resource as very limited from the, the medieval Tibetan literary resources and to ask, how does this potentially at least in theory, helps women transform their inferiorities by taking part in consort relationships. So the first case study is a very interesting chapter from the Jime Gunga life story of Yeshe Tsogyal, where she parted ways with one of her former lovers as her very last step to go forth into homelessness the state. So she was to be exiled in a desert, um, deserted forest. And she was accompanied by young men and women who supposedly were her attendants. So she started much like the Santora. And again, uh, Liz Dengowski has written a lot about this. So much like the Santora and in the Jataka tales, she started giving away her worldly possessions. So her gold, her clothing, her decorations, the state elephant, which I find it to be a, a fun call out to, to the Santora story. And the very last person she parted ways with um, is this man called um, Garanacha Shetanjian. And they had a really long conversation that is, I find it very endearing, but also hearkening to a lot of South Asian Kama Sutra or erotic literature tropes of love and desire that you see of a very tender relationship being unfolding. So he had an intimate relationship with the princess who's Yeshe Tsogyal. He was, he found it hard to bear their separation. So they sent songs back and forth to each other. And in the end, I think the princess convinced him to say that I'm gonna leave you with this gold ring of mine and this will be our parting gift. May we meet again in a Kanishta heaven. 
And immediately after that, the princess on her way to the forest was actually capt captured by one of her suitors. And this is another, and I should um, give a trigger warning here. So there is an episode which I read to be a scene of sexual assault. So she was assaulted by one of her suitors. She woke up the next morning, totally desperate, sang another song to call out to Master Padmasambhava. And this is a moment when he first appeared in her life story due to her supplication to him, but also due to their past karmic connections. And during their conversation, she, she was confirmed that he is to be his consort. So their relationship is predestined. But very interesting, another detail is that Pamasambhava also gave Yeshitogi a ring that freed her of her shackles that was put on her by her suitors. And that's how they end up being able to travel to Samye together. Mm. So I find the repetition of the ring as a parting gift, but also as a way of establishing karmic connections, really mm. interesting. And the relationship she dealt with her, what I call her ex or her <laughs> previous uh, yeah. intimate friend and her relationship with Pamasambhava is seems to come at this point of her transformation to become a Buddhist practitioner. Yes, and, and um, yeah. I was just going to say, if we just go on to this sort of idea of celibacy and being a nun, um, so many people might be quite surprised that Princess Mandarava and Yeshi Sogyo have been, and see, you know, in the literature, see themselves as nuns, and you mentioned this in your thesis. Um, and I think part of that is also to do with they, they've been represented in the sort of kind of Western academic literature, let's say, you know, a sort of uh you know they're not necessarily accurately represented as the women they were right and uh, as nuns even so but I think also people don't understand and this is something that I've also kind of written about from a first-hand perspective not an academic perspective is you know being a consort um also unfortunately the sort of not so you know the abusive side of that as well but but also the being celibate and being a consort because People think there's a contradiction in that, and um, in an actual fact, uh, some would say it's actually very important to be celibate if you're going to be a tantric consort. So you know, there's this sort of misunderstanding that tantric practice and consort practice is a sexual thing, and you do actually refer to this in your your thesis. So maybe you could talk about that a little bit about how Yeshi Sogyal, you know, is referred to as a nun considered to be celibate in a way, uh, but that's completely consistent with her being a tantric consort of Padmasambhava, for example. Absolutely. I, I think you summarized it really well, probably <laughs> better than I could. Okay. I will just highlight that mm -hmm. there are multiple instances yeah. Yishi Sogyo refer to herself, not just in the title of a noun, but very clearly someone who is a renunciant, someone mm -hmm. who is celibate. And the similar thing happens in the life story of Mandarava, which was um, discovered a little bit later. And there's also an episode when Mandarava first met Padmasambhava, they started practicing together. And there were rumors going around in the palace, and they classically had to go through trials and perform magics to, to prove their purity, in a sense. So I think there is, in this kind of imagination, to see that cultural relationship is not your secular intimacy. And I think that's a very clear message to not mix those two up. It is a higher, it is a sublimated form of intimate relationship that ultimately contributes to your enlightenment. And I think that's the, the theological argument those narratives are making. And if you, again, going back to the X story is that you can mm. really see that too. It's literally a ring being given up and being replaced with something that looks similar, but is completely different. And it contains yeah. magical transformative power. Yes. And, and that's why I thought it was interesting when you mentioned about the, the sexual assault, because there is another story, um, which I don't think is in your thesis. So I'm not sure, but you meant, you know, they call it the rape of Yeshi Sogya, where, you know, she's kind of in a solitary place and she these bandits attack her. Um, and again, the sort of theological dimension where she actually, so something that is very worldly and kind of ordinary uh, is then transformed by her into something, you know, enlightening or tantric, right? So is that reverse thing happens as well, would, would you say? 
Exactly. And the episode you mentioned took place in the Dakshin Niden Doji life story yes. of Yoshitsu girls in the 17th century. So there you can see her not only being able to be transformed, but you can transform others, men who are mm. lusting after her to, to an enlightened state. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So that it has that sort of two way dimension to it. So um, just before we 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 go on to uh, Yoshisoge as Kandroma, which obviously is fascinating as well because um, the whole notion of what a dakini is. Um, so you know, just briefly, we can talk about the goals of consort practice. Again, you know, you 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 very you know expertly bring out there's these kind of three sort of goals: one of liberation, treasure revelation, and healing. Right. So um, maybe again, you could just speak a little to that about what you say about that. Of course. And I, I should say this is, again, me trying to use a heuristic category by uh, Sarah Jacoby in her book, Love and Liberation, where she first brought up this threefold distinction of consort function. Mm. So one is to, to think about what consort practice actually do. And I, I think there is a linguistic function and which we can talk a little bit more maybe when we get into her role as a consort. There's a therapeutic function, which I think is more pronounced in the 20th century Nima literature Sir Jacoby was reading about. But we see examples of that in the 17th century life story of Yoshitsuge, where she is said to have been able to revive the dead. Mm. And there is a short episode mm. in the earlier literature where Yoshitsuge and Pama Sambhava cured King Chisung Dezen's disease. So I think you can see earlier examples of that threefold category already present in medieval Tibet. And of course, there's the ultimate enlightenment goal. So there's a soteriological benefit that is also brought about by construct practice. But none of those, as you can see, kind of going back to our original point is that relate to secular gains. Mm. So in essence, it is set apart from secular intimacy again. Yes, exactly. Okay, great. Well, let's move on to now uh, Yeshisagya as Dakini. So this is your fourth and your last chapter in your thesis, and it, it highlights the particular significance of the Dakini um, and what that means, especially within perhaps the treasure context. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you you give a very nice definition as well of what a Dakini is there, you know, and how um, you say in the expanded definition of the Kandrama, it's equated with the feminine in general. It's the female bodhisattva and the mother of all Buddhas. It is the feminine foundation for all practitioners, like the glacier is the source for all rivers. It even hails the female body as superior in benefiting beings. The Kandroma has taken over other female divinities and become a uniquely Tibetan phenomenon. The complexity of her activities also resists a clear definition, making the Kandroma a grab bag term for virtually any Buddhist women, right? So this is, I took uh, from your thesis. So um, so maybe we can talk a little bit then about, you know, what, what is a Dakini in terms of the Indian precedents and Tibetan developments and um, how and where Yeshi Sogyo fits into that, if if anything. Thank you. It's such a fascinating category, and I, I think it speaks to the power of the term, right? Dakini as well as Kanjoma. So what I did in that chapter is there's a little section that traces the Indian or Indic origins of the term, because we, we see the word Dakini being used not only in Tibetan Buddhist literature, but also in um, early Indian tantric literature, both in the Buddhist and the Hindu tradition as well. So there are usually a group of minor deities. So there's some matakas, there's mother goddesses, there's dakinis, there's the yoginis, and there's a number of different goddesses that are generally ferocious and malintended, and they can be usually transformed or subjugated through tantric practice and to, to serve different purposes. But a very interesting thing happened is that I, I think the dakini was picked out in Tibetan Buddhist literature and especially in Nima treasure literature to be the, the goddess par excellence, I think is the, the term that I used. So it was heavily Buddhized, where we see there is a five-fold categorization of Dakini. There's mm -hmm. wisdom Dakini, action Dakini, lotus Dakini, and so on and so forth. You see that in the in the Kanjuminti in the 13th and 14th century, 
and that categorization was reinforced. So I think there's some long reason for that is one is this is a time when Tibetan Buddhist historians, mostly Nima historians at this time, trying to reimagine the story of how Tibet was tamed as a land of Buddhism. You see in the Mani Kabum of the two famous stories of Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara taming the rock ogress by having offsprings with her and that becomes the, the forefathers of the Tibetan, Tibetan population. You have the story of Princess Wenchen coming from China to Tibet, her carriage was stuck in the sand and she, through geomancy, discovered the land of Tibet is actually in the shape of demoness. It's a very famous image. Mm. We have scholars also writing about that as well, of the land of Tibet basically being considered to be a female hostile spirit that needs to be forcefully subjugated by powerful Buddhist teachers. So I see Yeshi Togil Spro as Dakini as continuing this trope so she is still a local Tibetan woman, but in this case, she's more willingly becoming the disciple of Padmasambhava and becoming a part of the creation of Buddhist tradition in Tibet. So I think one of the subtitles I use, a demoness that no longer needs subjugation. And that's exactly yes. what I mean. Yes. And, uh, you know, when you talk about the, you know, Kandrama as a myth, you know, as you say, demoness that does not need subjugation, an agent without agency or a childless mother. And yes, I thought the section on the demoness as Tibet, you know, the Tate, you know, and that uh, great map of the demoness as Tibet, which, you know, I will, I'd like to include in, in the sort of article that's going along with this interview is um is fascinating and and visually uh very very interesting indeed so um now uh just to finish then on the yeshi sogila's dakini so you again you use a very nice uh subtitle here called fuzzy femininities and muddled myth um and again you know very interesting so why why did you say fuzzy femininities there I think, well, aside from creating alliteration that makes myself happy, um, is really I I feel like there is not a clear answer of what it means to be mm. a woman in 14th century Tibet as it is today. And I like to, at least in my revision, to going back to the threefold distinction of gender and to say that Tibetan Buddhist women in many cases, represented by Yeshi Tsogyo or claiming the authority of Yeshi Tsogyo, is constantly thinking about creative ways to negotiate the threefold distinction of gender, mm -hmm. how their biological sex impact their social condition, their cultural condition, and how their so-called enlightened ability as the sacred principle, female principle, can also play into and perhaps in some cases improve their condition, their social existence as a very much embodied gendered being. So, and that is, that does not have a singular answer for all Tibetan Buddhist women at all times. So every woman in all our different conditions choose to deal with these questions differently. But hopefully that threefold framework gives us something to, to use to see maybe this is how they're making their argument and maybe this is how they're creating their space. Okay, well, that's, yeah, I mean, that's, that's really interesting. And, uh, you know, again, I, I would recommend if people can, you know, to read your thesis, or I guess your your upcoming book, which we can talk about at the end. Now, um, in the final part of this interview, I wanted to uh, look at your work, uh, and a recent academic paper you wrote called Tilling the Fields of Merit, which was about uh, in 2020, which was on your work on, in Larangar. Jigme, uh, Kimpo Jigme Punsok, and the Kenmo program there, as well as this um, Ariyatari in the Great Treasury of Dakine teachings, um, and also some of the interesting observations you made about the nuns and their sort of view of gender equality or empowerment and biology and what that means to them, um, as you say. So perhaps um, we can start with um, Larangar and um, Kimpo Jigme Punsok. Uh, so, you know, you talk about this in the paper, 
Um, and in particular, not only what he did to, to institute the chemo program there, but also, you know, the non-sectarianism there at Larangar. I mean, you mentioned how he includes Han Chinese practitioners and, uh, you know, did this teaching at Mount uh, Wutai, which is which is very interesting. So perhaps you could talk about him a little bit first, and then we'll talk about the Kenmo program itself there. Absolutely. Um, I should mention that the article Teaching the Field of Merit is co-authored with Andrew S. Taylor at mm -hmm. College of San Scholastica. Okay. And a lot of the, the research we have done is part of this long-term collaboration project we have been doing since 2017. So we have we have traveled together, we have done interviews together, and we also wrote together on the on this very topic. So I, and then to answer the question of what's so fascinating about Larangar, I think for me, and I cannot speak for Andrew, is that it is a, a very creative way of thinking about the role of Tibetan Buddhism in the 20th and in the 20th century, 21st century, not in the term of a uh, post-enlightenment modernity model, but in very distinct Tibetan Buddhist terms. And I think Kenbo, Kenbo Jime Punto, as a fascinating, charismatic Buddhist leader, provided his answer in the way of multiple levels of inclusivity. Mm -hmm. So in terms of sectarian distinctions, the curriculum at Laron was inclusive or elect eclectic. And in terms of the population there, there's Han Chinese disciples, there were Tibetan disciples, there were also Western disciples at one point. And he is also very famously and in line with this inclusivity, very famously welcoming female Buddhist practitioner to the extent that I think at one point, all the women who wants to become nuns know that Larangar is the place to go. Mm -hmm. So I think in essence, it is a, a quite representative example of what Tibetan Buddhist theorists and thinkers are thinking about and constructing a future for Tibetan Buddhism in our time. Yes. Um, well, again, you know, absolutely fascinating for those people who've never, you know, visited or heard of Larangar. Um, but your in terms of the Kenmo program, then, so you talk about that um, the first female Kenmos were were kind of awarded their Kenmos in two thousand and four. So you say that these are kind of the first in Tibetan Buddhist history to get such degrees. And as of two thousand eighteen, there were just under two hundred graduated Kenmos associated with Larang. Um, and in fact, one of the abbots of Larang estimated 104 Tibetan Kemos at Larangar, 58 of whom are on leave due to sickness or other reasons. Now, um, you say as well that the Kemo program, which was once run by senior monks and Kemos, is today run largely by the Kemos themselves, that a majority of the teachers are Kemos rather than Kempos. Um, and so, you know, this is this is absolutely, you know, brilliant because um, I don't think there is an equivalent in exile. Uh I'm certainly not aware of one in, in Tibetan exile. So, you know, perhaps you could talk a little bit about that. And um, and then we'll talk about the, you know, their publication side. Absolutely. I, I think in terms of chronology, the Kemo students or the Kemo graduate, I should say, in early 2000s certainly predates what we have seen of the Geishima exams that's happening in uh, in the exile community. So at Domaling, close to Dharamsala, but also I think there is a now a chemical program in Nangjolin mm -hmm. in uh, Balakupe, so South India. So that is actually, but that is something people know less about, mm -hmm. I think due to it being located quite remotely in Eastern Tibet. Mm -hmm. And I, I think you're likely correct in that in terms of scale, it's quite um, it's something that we have not seen before. And again, I like to credit this to Kenpo Jimmy Punso's strategy. We, Andrew and I like to call it ask for forgiveness, not for permission. Yes. So he did not start with a theoretical justification of women's intellectual capacities. Instead, he just did it. He told a few of his students and said, you, know, you should study for Kenpo. And one of our favorite stories is that they don't know what Kenpo is, how to look up in a dictionary. But of course, it's not in a dictionary. So that speaks to the innovation aspect of this program. So they just started studying and he really emphasized on they do the same curriculum and have the same rigorous exams as the monks. 
and once the nun had passed the exams with flying colors, as everyone expected, so they don't need to prove their intellectual capacity because they have just did it. And then he started to make them teach to increase their presence in the local non-monastic community as well, which I think is, uh, again, the genius in the design of the camera program. Okay, so we're talking about Larangar and the the Kemmos there, and uh, you know you mentioned also Dolmaling in exile. And actually, I studied there for two years, and um, one of the things I also noticed, I was a day student, but um, I mean, you mentioned that, for example, in Larangar, uh, one of the defining features is that it, it actually has more female monastics than male, right? So there's like three thousand five hundred nuns, you say one thousand five hundred monks. And the, also the administration prioritizes women's education and practice over men's um, with the fact that, you know, a lot of the teachers are Kenmos, right? So this is something that is yet to happen in exile, I think, you know, even in institutions like Doma Ling, certainly as far as I, I saw. Um, and one of the most interesting aspects as well about that sort of uh, empowerment of women there was the Ariatare, which is the publishing arm of Larong, which you say annually produces dozens of books and publications, as well as other multimedia materials. In particular, their great treasury of Dakini teachings, a 53 volume collection of works by and about important Buddhist women. Um, and you, you, you talk about this in the fact how the editors collected all these stories. So, um, you know, this is this is very interesting. So perhaps you could talk a little bit about that collection. And also you mentioned Kemmo Yinten as a Kemmo who's actually authored an eight volume commentary on the five text traditions. So uh, these are, I think, quite sort of unprecedented in a way, certainly in exile. I don't think that's that kind of thing is happening. Thank you. I, I'd love to visit Domaling someday. <laughs> Hopefully it'll happen soon. And yes, so the Ar yeah. Oh yeah, I am sure. So the Aryatari Publishing House is actually the publishing house mm -hmm. at Larong in the sense that it is entirely run by nuns and they publish everything, every publication that is needed and or they wanted to do at Larong. So you they don't only publish materials related to women so they also do a lot of the textbook as well so which speaks to i think the degree of learning and knowledge and expertise the the kimbos and the nuns running ariatari have so they they do a lot of this kind of sorts of publishing but um, i think one of their most impressive achievements for me and the most creative part is the three collections of publications focusing on women. So starting with 2013, the volume I first encountered when I started my PhD is a 15 volume collection on the life stories of great Buddhist women, starting from India to all the way through Nepal to Tibet. And in 2015, they had another 15 volume collection of writings by Tibetan Buddhist women, starting with Yishi Tsogyo and you have a Machik Lajun, Sarah Kangjo, Kangjo Tari Lamo, and with a few other, I think Sonam Bejan and Mingyur Bejan with a few other Buddhist, female Buddhist writers in between. And all of those combined and with extra additional material in 20, I think 2017, and I could be wrong there, um, is when they published this great 53 volume collection called Kangjo Chizui Chimmo, so the great treasury of Dakini teachings. And it is a extraordinary volume, contains everything that has been published before, but also with additional materials is where they usually actually look for Shulan literature about women. And we actually have not talked about this. So I'm so glad and so surprised to see they see that as a promising genre where you hear women's voice. Mm -hmm. They chose a lot of the shit down the advice genre there's a lot of praises to female masters, this jutta, their sadhanas. So they also kind of go through the, I don't want to say the entirety, but the, the vast trove of Tibetan Buddhist literature and really trying to, in in my reading, to assert a, a canon that where Buddhist women find their voices and find their place. So I think in that way, the, the great treasury of Dakin teachings is just a fascinating collection. 
Yeah, and uh, as you say, the fact that it's pulled together and edited by women as well makes it even more so, right? And so in terms of Kemo Yenten then, um, so this was also fascinating because women as scholars in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition as, you know, Kemo's or Geshima's, um, again, an eight volume commentary on the five tech traditions, which gives an overview of the entire Langrong Kemo curriculum. Um, now, this, again, seems to be something sort of quite groundbreaking in a way. Um, I'm not aware of a sort of uh, a Tibetan female scholar in exile from the sort of nunnery producing sort of commentaries. I'm not, I'm not aware of that. So, yeah, perhaps you could talk a little bit about Kemo Yinten. Absolutely. She's such a fascinating figure. And I think you are correct in recognizing this is entirely unprecedented mm -hmm. in exile community as well as in Tibetan Buddhist communities in China. So I was lucky enough to actually have met her and interviewed her um, in Yushu. So she has since been relocated to, to a different satellite mm -hmm. nunnery apart from Larong. And one story I really like to share, I think speaks to the influence of those camels is when we arrived at Yushu, we started asking people where the nunneries are and people just started telling us without us asking questions, how impressive they are. And they say they never met nuns so educated and they can not talk. So I think they carry themselves in a very educated but also mm. assertive way that people are have not seen before. So I think really speaks to their own achievements. Mm. So Kemo, what Kemo Yunden told me is that she started this commentary as her own teaching notes when she was teaching the Kemo, Kemo curriculum, which contains the classical five treatises. Mm -hmm. And then the demands become so high that she realized it might she might as well formalize it in the form of a publication. Yes. It was published individually before, but was in 2017 included in um, in the form of eight individual volumes in the Great Treasury of Dakini Teachings. And I, I think it is important in that we don't really think of commentaries as something crucial in our everyday life in a modern society. But in the Tibetan Buddhist literary tradition, this is way for you to insert your own philosophical, theological interpretation into a continuous living Buddhist scholastic tradition. And to my knowledge, I think she is the first woman to have done so in a systematic way yeah. to all of those important treatises. And not just nuns, but monks are using it as well. So yeah. I find that to be something definitely worth highlighting. Yeah, definitely. And uh, a lot of people, again, may not be aware of that. Uh, and so it's it's worth highlighting here, too. So um, now just to finish then. So, you know, these nuns who are, you know, showing these high levels of education, of writing commentaries and, you know, teaching. So you also mentioned in this article about how, uh, you know, how do Tibetan nuns or Kemmos regard sort of gender and you know, <clears throat> the female sort of idea of, you know, female empowerment, let's say, or, um, and you mentioned that, you know, they often regard that more in biological and karmic terms rather than a social or discursive category, you know, as you mentioned, like Judith Butler or other deconstructionists. And, um, and that they believe that there were certain tendencies intrinsic to women that would hinder one's practice, irrespective of cultural or educational context. So, um, you know, you even quote some, none saying you know that women tend to be more narrow-minded and talk about each other behind each other's backs you know and have inferior bodies and some people might see that as kind of you know a social conditioning where you know women may be sort of unaware that these are kind of more stereotypes but yeah well what, so you know this is a very interesting question and again it comes also to the sort of uh, also the biology and karma, you know, the theological gender aspect you, you, you mentioned, which is to do with Vajrayana practice as well, and how the biology is very important in that, you know, not just on the outer level, but on the inner level as well. So, yeah, what was your sort of overall sort of understanding and view of that and how nuns were sort of seeing that whole idea of gender and biology? 
Thank you. I This is a fascinating question and it's something I have been thinking about since meeting them and rethinking and constantly reevaluating every time I talk to those nuns. And I think it is fascinating in the way that um, many of those nuns, they speak Tibetan, they were educated, they received basic literacy education when they came to Laro most of the time. Most of them don't know Chinese and not even English. So in a sense, they were entirely unfamiliar with a liberal progressive mm. feminist model. So I think it is really interesting when I started to to talk to them about terms like feminism, they heard it translating in modern Tibetan, weren't quite sure what it means. Some find it interesting, like, cool, I could be a feminist, something, no, I'm a Buddhist. And mm. so they're varied reaction to those categories kind of prompted me to think about so how do mm. they think about gender because clearly as they reiterated in every preface of their publication they want to elevate women's status so what does that mean to them how do they theorize that so this is a project i'm still thinking about and it's constantly ongoing maybe what i could do is just to highlight some of the interesting differences i noticed mm. So I think one thing you already mentioned this um, a while ago is uh, the idea of karma. Mm. So a lot of them, when I asked them, do you want to be reborn as a man or a woman in your next life? They all said men. Mm. And I, I don't think this is a recognition of patriarchy. And mm. I would suggest we not read it that way, but to read it as a way of affirming the Buddhist theory of being women carries inferior karma. But that's not necessarily a negation of the female gender, but rather mm -hmm. some gender could be even considered as something incidental if you have a different gender in every lifetime. So I think that's quite liberative and quite challenging mm -hmm. for, for a Western audience to, to think about as gender as incidental. You can just have a different one in your next yes. life based on what you do here. And so how does the ethical aspect play into this? I think it's super interesting. Yeah. And another thing is, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, and also even, but again, some someone might say, well, but there's also all that other in terms of karma of, you know, the, the female as mother, the sort of, you know, the superiority of that, because, you know, the, the, the comparison with, you know, the great wisdom mother, you know, the mother of all the Buddhas, the mother is, you know, is a kind of a biological term, which is very much associated with a kind of almost a superiority in a way, or, uh, and even Padmasambhava, I think, said, right, that uh, if a woman really wants to uh, go on the path to enlightenment, it's easier for her because she tends to have, you know, kind of more compassion or, so, you know, as a mother. So there are these sort of kind of contradictions there, even within the tradition, right, would you say? Absolutely. And motherhood is actually the second maybe questions that I like to throw out there is mm. they actually... For me, when I read their writings, I don't see them distinguish being a woman and being a mother. So motherhood is inherently contained in womanhood, which again, might make some some feminists here at a certain generation unhappy because there was that separation that was intentional. But also they read motherhood in a very capacious way, I think it's both Inher inheriting the Buddhist tradition, mm. but also trying to create their own motherhood discourse in that they, like you said, view mother as the embodiment of compassion. But they also collapse the mother, Pragna Paramita, the goddess of wisdom, as the, the mother of all Buddhas. So they will claim that identity as well, but also claim the, the human women's ability to give birth to mothers. So there's the collapsing of different discourses on motherhood again to utilize that for them to also elevate women's status not just in monastic communities but also in the society at large mm. so that's really fascinating as well it is and you mentioned that you're going to be looking at you know Yeshi Sogyo the mother you know as the kind of also the mother and what that means um so just to finish then um because uh you know obviously it is extraordinary that um these women at Laranga have managed to attain this high level status of education of publishing of uh you know writing and you know the same cannot necessarily be said in Tibetan exile and so that's interesting because um 
is that testament to the Jigme Kempo Jimmy Punsok? Or, you know, what, what could be the potential reason that that hasn't yet really happened in exile? I mean, obviously, there are sort of programs to try and get that level of, you know, interaction or participation, but certainly not at the level of Larangar. So what's your sort of uh, observation of that? Why why do you think it's been able to be so successful there? Um, and yet not in, you know, people might, Think, well, it surely that should have really happened in in sort of somewhere like India, maybe you know. I should say that I'm not familiar with the, the actual situation in India, so it's hard really for me to evaluate that. Yes. But I I have met nuns from India, I have met nuns from Bhutan, and they strike me as fascinatingly smart mm -hmm. and also assertive and confident as the nuns I have met in Eastern Tibet. But if I were to guess just solely on what contributes to Larangar's success, I, I think the nuns themselves, their eager, eagerness to learn, their willingness to, to spend the time. And I think in the article you, you quoted, we actually had a, a short part where we discussed their schedule, which is a schedule mm -hmm. I don't live by. It's quite demanding, <laughs> but which also speaks to their level of enthusiasm and determination. Except. And I think that happening on a mass scale really created this phenomenon of this group of brilliant Tibetan Buddhist women and are actually actively creating their space, their cultural space, their religious space for women in Tibetan Buddhism at this time. Yeah, well, it is absolutely amazing to read about and very inspiring and fascinating. So thank you very much for sharing all of that research and knowledge with us and in your your phd now just to end then uh in terms of your future plans so you mentioned you're you're producing a book at the moment which is based on your phd so when when will that come out thank you uh for asking me so i can get pressured and actually have a deadline <laughs> so i'm in the in the thick of revising it and hopefully the manuscript will be completed by the end of this year and it'll be out in the next couple of years and i i still as we were having this conversation, I was reminded of a lot of things that got me excited in the study of Tibetan Buddhist women. So I hope to to ride this wave of positive, positivity and finish it very soon. Yes, well, uh, I hope so too. And uh, obviously you're adding in also extra things as well, which aren't in your, your, your thesis as well, right? So there will be um, new things in there too, right? Yes, absolutely. So the revision is, um, quite extensive in the disciple chapter in, okay. in the sense that I decided to cut out the, the formal aspect of Shulin scripture just to kind of make the argument more integrated in a way focusing on the theological, social, and um, biological genders. Also, I decided to add a chapter on mother also due to the conversation I keep having with Tibetan Buddhist nuns yeah. today. And I think motherhood deserves its separate chapter and not to be yes. combined with the chapter on Dakini. So a lot of those three chapters will have uh, major revisions. Wonderful. Well, then just to end, uh, if you were to sort of sum up in your kind of having studied all of this material about Yeshi Sogyal, you know, in, in terms of your own personal sort of inspiration or take on Yeshi Sogyal, you know, what what is it about her or her life that particularly strikes you as you know, very inspiring and and you know, in terms of so much focus still and interest in Yeshi Sogyal. So for you personally, what does what does Yeshi Sogyal mean to you? Thank you. Uh, it's a it's a great question, and I I'm gonna steal one of the the nuns' answer when I ask them what do Ye, what does Yeshi Sogyal mean to them. One of the nuns replied to say that it is. I, it br bring me to tears every time I read it um, about her determination to practice. And I, I wish I could live like her. And I, I think for me, this is the part that's personally inspiring. And I have been fortunate enough to be surrounded by a cluster of female mentors. Mm -hmm. Some of them I have named in this interview and many of, there's many, many more others who have helped me in various different ways. I think there is this interconnected web of support, of advice I have been so lucky to to receive during my study and are continuing to receive 
And I think this is something that constantly inspires me is I, I learn about them. I learn about their views, their knowledge, their courage, mm. all of their different virtues. And it inspires me to, to be a little bit like them. So I think that is what I find most valuable for me personally in the Yoshitsuge life story. Yes, definitely. And uh, as you say, you're very fortunate. You've had that kind of female mentors and support. And in a way, Yeshi Sogyo didn't really, right? In fact, sometimes the opposite. Um, and so that resilience and that sort of determination, yeah, I think is inspiring to many, many uh, women and men who, you know, sometimes find themselves lacking support or kind of being quite isolated that, you know, even despite that, there are these examples, um, you know, like Yeshi Sogyo, but also, you know, obviously like Miller Raper and all of that, where they kind of defeat those sorts of odds and uh, still manage to, you know, attain the results, so to speak. Well, anyway, um, it's been an absolute pleasure talking about all of this, and uh, of course, could talk much more about it. <laughs> but time is limited, and I just wanted to thank you very much again for, you know, participating in this, and uh, you know, wish you all the best of luck with your your book. And uh, yeah, thanks once again. Thank you very much for inviting me and for such a thoughtful conversation. I had a great time.